chapter 1, Luke chapter 1, these last several weeks, <clears throat> we've been in a Christmas message series called The Spirit of Christmas. And we've asked the question, what is the biblical spirit of Christmas? And we talked about all the answers you might could get if you were asked people to define the spirit of Christmas. We've gone all through that. So we decided to take a look at the people in the first Christmas story, the first Christmas narrative, and see how they responded, and see if they have a word for us about what really is <clears throat> the true spirit of Christmas. And again, that depends on whom you ask. It varies from person to person. We know that there's a lot of things around this season that distract us from what we called by cliche the true meaning of Christmas and deflect us for maybe the more important things. Some are, most are good and most are nice, good things. And what is truly the spirit of Christmas? Of course, that term's never actually used in the scripture, but we use it a lot. And I wonder if the Bible has a definition of what the true spirit of Christmas is. Is. is there a spirit of Christmas presented and regulated and commanded in the Bible? Not just for the Christmas season, but for all of our Christian journey. We looked at several people so far. We looked at Elizabeth, Mary's aunt, when she was presented with the realization of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, in Mary's womb. And we saw there that she was filled with the Spirit and quoting the Scriptures. Elizabeth blessed. Elizabeth said to Mary, blessed is the fruit of your womb. That's worship. Elizabeth went on to say, the fruit of your womb is my Lord. That's worship. We went to Elizabeth's husband, Zachariah, who was a temple priest. And when John was brought to the temple to be dedicated, he understood that John would be the forerunner of the Christ. John the Baptist would prepare the way for the Christ. And in knowing that, Zechariah, quote, blessed God. That's worship. And then he sang a song. In Latin, it's called the Benedictus, the song of Zechariah, in which he continued to praise God for the coming Messiah, whom his son, of whom his son would be the forerunner. We looked at a lady that was in the temple there with Zechariah that day. Anna, who is an elderly lady who just hung around the church all the time. And when she saw the worship of Zechariah, she too, and I quote, said, Glory to God. And she also sang. We talked about the angels on that night of Jesus' birth who sang glory to God in the highest. That's worship. We talked about the shepherds upon seeing the angels and hearing the angels and going to Bethlehem and seeing the baby Christ in the manger, returning back to the shepherd fields, and they said, quoting Scripture, glorifying and praising God. There was a man named Simeon, also at the temple that we looked at, and when he held the baby Jesus and realized this is the Messiah, he sang a song. He, first, the Bible says he blessed God, and then he gave us a song. In the Latin, it's called the Nunc Dementis, the Song of Simeon. Again, the song that praised God for the Messiah. Again, Anna gave thanks to God. And we looked at the wise men when they came to visit Mary and Joseph a couple of years later. And as they were leaving, the Bible says they were filled with exceeding great joy and worshiped Christ. Do you see a theme? Do you see a pattern? Do you see a template? Blessing God. Thanking God. Saying glory to God in the highest, praising God, giving thanks, being filled with exceeding great joy, and worshiping the Christ. Now we come full circle to a 
certainly major player <laughs> in the Christmas narrative. We come all the way back to Mary herself. Mary herself. You don't have to turn there, but in Luke 1, 26, 1, chapter 1, verses 26 through 38, you read the story of how Gabriel was sent from God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth, of all places, to Mary, a virgin who was engaged to a man named Joseph the angel Gabriel, first he had to tell her, don't be afraid. Because she was in the presence of an angel. She, the angel said, don't be afraid. But here's what the angel said. Greetings, O favored one, the Lord is with you. And she was greatly troubled. But again, don't be afraid. Do not be afraid, for you have favor with God. And then the angel goes on to tell her what's going to happen. You're going to conceive in your womb and bear a son. You shall call his name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. And of his kingdom there shall be no end. And Mary said to him, how can this be? I'm a virgin. The angel said, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. And the child will be born he will be holy, the Son of God. And behold, Elizabeth, in her old age, has conceived a son named John. Nothing is impossible with God, he says. And then Mary responded. She said, I am the servant of the Lord. And that is worship. Let it be to me according to to your word. I'm not sure you worship any more deeply than when you say, God, I am your servant, and whatever you have planned for me, here I am. That has to be the crux of worship, that kind of surrender. And that's what Mary did. So we come back to her. She who was closest to the birth of Christ, who had an intimacy with Christ that no other human being had, she was most directly touched by the birth of Christ. Mother and son. And for her, though, it was just more than, it was more than just motherhood. Although that's a wonderful and a great thing. It was more than just giving birth to a son. She was going to be giving birth to the Son of God. And she exhibits that in her praise as she burst out at her soul at the thought of giving birth to the Redeemer. And the Savior, the Messiah. And then she sang a song. Do you see a pattern? Do you see a pattern? We call it the Magnificat. That's the Latin word for Mary's song. The Magnificat. And the word Magnificat means my soul glories the Lord. And there's four elements I want to see just in a couple of verses. We're not going to preach through the whole thing. Because y'all want to go home and have Christmas tomorrow. We're not going to do that. <laughs> I want to take just a couple of verses in Mary's Magnificat. And see if we can find something out about worship. We have talked about how to respond to Christ. And the spirit of Christmas is actually worship. And so I think she gives us, as well as the others, some insights. The others have told us, you know, worship and the spirit of Christmas is, is blessing God and glorifying God and praising God and thanking God. All parts of worship. And let's see what Mary says about maybe the nature of our worship during the Christmas season. And not just this season, but all throughout the year. All throughout the year. There's four words quickly this morning I want to share with you. Just in a couple of verses from her Magnificent. If you look there in Luke chapter 1, beginning with verse 46, here is, here is where she has, has met with Elizabeth. And John the Baptist has leaped in Elizabeth's womb at the presence of the Christ who was in Mary's womb. And so Elizabeth gives this outburst of praise. But then in verse 46, Mary begins. Mary said, my soul magnifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God, 
my Savior. For he has looked on the humble estate of his servant. For behold, from now on all generations will call me blessed. Now, we'll stop there. Those are the two couple of verses I want to focus on. But let's keep reading the rest of this. For he who is mighty has done great things for me, and holy is his name. And his mercy is for those who fear him from generation to generation. He has shown strength with his arm. He has scattered the proud in thoughts of their hearts. He has brought down the mighty from their thrones and exalted those of humble estate. He has filled the hungry with good things and the rich he has sent away empty. He has helped his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy as he spoke to our fathers, to Abraham and to his offspring forever. What magnificent theology from a 14-year-old girl, Mary. Wow. This is not a theologian talking. This is not a preacher talking. This is a 14 or 15-year-old girl that knows all this about God. I'll return to that, Lord willing, in a moment. What are four elements here that she gives us here? First of all, worship is internal. Look again in verse 46. Mary said, my soul. The Greek word there is psyche. Psyche, who I am. My soul, the very depths of who I am, magnifies the Lord. And verse 47, my spirit, pneuma. My spirit, that that which gives me life, my breath. She's saying the deepest part of me, as directed and driven and engined, if you want to use that word, by the very breath of me, the very depth of me, gives glory to God. Not just from here out, (laughs) but from down here out. She says, my soul and my spirit rejoices and magnifies my God, my Savior, my inner being, my mind and emotion and will and heart. True worship, ladies and gentlemen, swells from within. And that's the idea here. Mary is saying there's something swelling down deep within me that causes me to burst out and in worship and praise and thanksgiving for God, for what He is doing, not just for me, but for the nation of Israel and for the entire world. A Messiah is coming. And inside of her, like an orchestra that's made up of different, different uh, musical instruments, body, soul, spirit, but it all comes together. In a crescendo of beautiful music, she says, that's how I come together. Psyche and soul and spirit and body and emotion and will and volition and everything just orchestrates together in a bursting out of praise. And that is worship. One thing about worship, we need to understand that worship comes from deep within. We have helps in worship, but we not, must understand the functions of worship are not synonymous with worship. For example, some people look so much to the physical things of worship, the stained glass, or the music, or yea, even the sermon, or even the Bible, as a physical, tangible thing. For some, it might be a candle, or kneeling posture, or Even praying. All those things are good. But just having those things around do not constitute biblical worship. Because worship doesn't come from things. It comes from the heart. It comes from the heart. And you can worship without all those things. Because it comes from the heart. And she shows us that worship is eternal. Often you and I are so preoccupied with other things. Even during the Christmas season, there's an awareness of Christ, but often it can be superficial and external and even shallow sometimes. 
we know that there's a baby in a manger somewhere. <laughs> but we got food and friends and family and festivities to attract our attention. Nothing wrong with those things. God made an interesting indictment against his people Israel in Isaiah 29 and verse 13. God said to his people, this people draw near me with their mouth and with their lips. They do honor me, but they have removed their heart far from me. The gathering is good. It's biblical. It is commanded together, together. The singing is good. The fellowship is good. The praying is good. The sermon, hopefully, is good. But without the heart, God says it's pretty much worthless to me. If this doesn't capture your heart, if worship doesn't capture your heart, God says you can sing the songs, you can say the words, you can do all the Jesus talk, and sing all the Jesus songs, but, and I quote God here, they have removed their heart far from me. Worship is internal. It bursts forth from a recognition of who God is and who Christ is and who the Holy Spirit and what God has done through Christ for us and through His Holy Spirit. We burst forth in worship. Worship is eternal. Secondly, internal. Worship is intense. When you dig into the text here again, verse 46, And Mary said, My soul, my psyche, the deepest parts of me, magnifies the Lord. The word magnify here is megalune. Mega, big, <laughs> huge, gargantuan. This is where the Latin word magnific magnificat comes from. This is not just some fancy theological term here about Mary's song, but it is the crux of the whole matter. My soul magnifies, mega. And it comes from two Greek words, mega, big, large, loud, gigantic, huge. And another word that means loud. It's almost redundant, <laughs> loud, and intense, and continuing. We'll get to that in a moment. It, the word lune means to cause to swell or to grow, to get larger. So Mary's sitting here with the realization that the Messiah is in her womb. Her, her Aunt Elizabeth, the, her baby just leaped in her womb. She's had an encounter with Gabriel who said, you're going to give birth to the Messiah and the Redeemer of Israel. And, and so she quietly goes to a back room, dims the lights, and just, she's just really quiet. Is that what happened? No. Her praise there with Elizabeth swells. It gets bigger. It's loud and it's continuing Verse 47, and my spirit, again, rejoices. That word means to be overjoyed, over the brim, joyous. Way out yonder, full of joy. Have you ever seen folks' face in Walmart one or two or three days before Christmas? Not a lot of joy. Not a lot of happiness. In fact, if you bump buggies with them, you, go may, you may meet Jesus that day. Not a, this is the most joyous season of the world. We all know that. We laugh about these things, don't we? You know why? We center our joy during the Christmas season in the wrong things. Nothing wrong with gifts. Nothing wrong with shopping. We've been all through that through this series. Nothing wrong with those things. But where is that joy? For Christians, I expect pagans to be mean. I do, and no offense, but if, I expect unbelievers not to be joyous. But we Christians have every reason to be intense about our worship. She says, I am, my soul mega swells. It mega grows and crescendos with 
over joy. She's not in a quiet corner somewhere expressing a few nice thoughts. She's not back in a corner somewhere patting her pregnant tummy saying, isn't that nice? Isn't that sweet? No, man, this, this gal here, she's overwhelmed by the presence of of Christ. Woe that our worship services perhaps looked more like that from time to time. Like her aunt Elizabeth that we preached on. She, she responded the same way Elizabeth did. With joy and swelling praise to God. Let me ask you a question here. How intense is your worship? Now, let me be clear. Biblical worship of Christ does not result in idiocy and indecency. He does not call us to roll on the floor and swing from the chandeliers and spit and vomit and bark like dogs. Amen? Amen. We are to worship with decency and in order. That's what the Bible commands. It doesn't, the worship of of Christ through the Holy Spirit does does not make a person act cray cray. And do silly, stupid, mindless things in the church building. He doesn't do that. But our internal worship ought to have some kind of intensity about it. How intense is your worship? Personal note here, I'm chasing a rabbit. So many of you, you tell me, and I appreciate it, one of the reasons you like my preaching is because I'm passionate, that I do raise my voice, or I do, I show some passion once in a while. Others say, I don't like that. You act like you're mad. So what do I do? You know what I'm saying? What do you do? What do you do? And all of us have musicians and all, we we have that struggle, you know, we don't want to we want to be passionate, but we don't want to be crazy, and we want everybody to worship. That's the point. So it's a struggle sometimes, but how intense is our worship? It is easy to become cold and indifferent towards worship. When's been the most intense time of your life? And think about a positive thing here, maybe not a negative thing. When you got that promotion at work, or you got that raise, or that grandbaby was born, or you got a new car, or a new house, and you were just intense with, with joy, and you were just overjoyed that you had gotten this thing or this person. Are you that intense and excited when you find a new scriptural truth as you are reading your Bible? Are you that intense and overjoyed when you walk through those doors on Sunday morning? To worship with the saints, to sing the songs of Zion, to hear the preaching of God's Word. Is there any intensity there? I've said this a couple of times lately, but perhaps our lack of intensity in worship is exhibited by our dragging in late. And yawning through the music, or sleeping through the sermon, or just skipping it all together. It speaks about our worship. I understand there can be an acquired boredom with church. I think probably all of us have visited or gone to churches that were, that were not intense in worship. And there was some boredom, and I understand that. 
But ladies and gentlemen, something is wrong when souls are not stirred by Christ-centered music and minds are not strengthened by Christ-centered sermons and hearts are not warmed by Christ-centered fellowship. Something is wrong. Worship is internal. It is intense. Read the Psalms. (laughs) When the psalmist would come to worship God, just read of his attitude, of of his uh, his place in the worship experience. Thirdly, according to Mary, we see that her worship is habitual. And I know these are things, maybe reading through the English text you might miss. That's why we dig a little deeper into the Greek text. Again, in verse 46, Mary said, my soul magnifies. Let's go back to that word, uh, megalune, mega loud, intense. Now, just like in English, Greek verbs give us definition and give us an understanding of what's being said. And the tense in which this verb, megalune, is written in Greek, it is in the continuative present tense. That says something about what Mary's saying. She said, my soul magnifies. My soul magnifies. Not just this morning at 1030. But it continues. In wherever I am, whatever present moment I am, it continues. It's a continuative verb. She says, I'm doing this right now with Elizabeth, my aunt. We're both praising God intensely, internally, but it's not going to stop when I go home. It's my habit, she says now, because of the good news of Gabriel and what I carry in my, my womb, because I know I'm, Christ is coming through me to redeem his people, I'm going to keep praising him. I'm going to keep continually every moment. That means I worship him not just at 1030 on a Sunday morning. That's good and, and, and commanded. But I'm going to do it too when I leave here and go to the brickery for lunch. Or Applebee's or Waffle House. It's hard to praise God in Waffle House, but it can be done. We do it. I'm not going when I when I leave those doors, when I walk through those doors and get in my car, it's not going to end. Worship is not just a Sunday morning thing. People used to say, Are we going to go to worship today? Well, <laughs> if you ask that question in your house and answer it no. That's really an indictment. No, we're not going to go worship today. Wow. Wow. It's hard to believe a Christian would say that. But instead, understand, yes, we worship here, but it doesn't stop here. Our worship personally, individually, continues in whatever present moment we find ourselves. It's a lifestyle. It's the way Christians live. Now, this ought to be a catalyst for it. The songs we sing and the messages that are preached and the fellowship we enjoy, certainly this ought to spur all of us on in continual worship this afternoon, next week, and all throughout the new year, certainly. And I think the church has a responsibility to do that. I think it's my job to spur you on in continual worship. You should expect that from me. It's intense. It's habitual. We love that phrase. I couldn't help but think about this in preparation of this message. We love that phrase, God is good all the time. All the time, God is good. I believe that. God's a good God. Although His goodness... And what I think his goodness should be has two different definitions. God is good all the time. All the time, God, all the time. He is a good God. That's one of his divine attributes. Yes, he is. But we love saying that when everything goes right. 
I got a great parking space at Walmart. God is good. I got a raise. God is good. We finally got our dream home. The kids got a trophy. Our team won. God is good. But what about when the cancer hits? Is God still good? What about when, like, my family and many families, you get that 2 a.m. phone call about a wayward child? Is God still good? Does He still demand my worship? Is He still worthy of my worship? Is He still a good God? Is He? Do, can I still worship Him when can I still say God is good even when there's nothing good happening at the moment? And that's why we have to train ourselves to worship. We have to be deeply involved with the Scriptures. We let, have to let the Scriptures guide and shape and direct our understanding of God and who He is and what He's accomplishing in His Word in the world through His sovereign will. We've got to understand, yes, God has a plan for my life, but I'm pretty sure it looks nothing like the plan I have for my life. But God is still good. He's still good. And that comes from worship. That comes from worship. Worship is internal. It's intense. It's habitual. Through the valley or on the mountaintop. Worship is worship. In the cold and in the heat, worship is worship. In the ups and the downs, worship is worship. In the ins and the outs, our worship of God. As hard as it is, because we're human, I understand that. But we must keep blessing and praising and thanking and glorifying God. Worship. One other thing I see in just a couple of verses here. There's an in, internality to this. There's an intensity to this. There is a habitualness to this. And fourthly, there is an humbleness, a humility to this. Verse 48, look what this young lady says. For God has looked on the humble estate of his servant. The word humble there, there's two or three Greek words for humble. The one that, one that Luke uses here means to be not far above the ground. <laughs> That's what this word means. Mary is saying, I know who I am. I'm a young peasant girl. I'm from Nazareth. Remember when one of the disciples told Philip that Jesus was from Nazareth, remember what Philip said? Can anything good come out of Nazareth? Nazareth? Checking to see who we got here today. Nazareth was the Alabama of the first century. I kid. Nazareth was a know-nothing city. In a know -nothing, no, nothing good ever came out of Nazareth to that point in history, but Jesus did. She knew who she was. She knew where she was from. She was a young teenage girl. She didn't come from an elite family. She didn't come from the well-to-do. She didn't come from high society. She was a poor peasant girl from a poor peasant town. Not rising far above the ground. But in praise, she said, God has looked on my humble estate. She knew who she was. She said, I'm a nobody. At best, I'm a handmaiden. 
But God has looked on my humble estate because God does not choose by wealth or status or position or title. God chooses whomever He pleases. Ain't that good news? He chooses whomever He pleases. Sometimes He he chooses up here. But I think more often than not, and I think Scripture bears this out, more often than not, He chooses from just above the ground. You know why I'm standing in front of you today? It's because Jesus chooses from just above the crown. And there was a humility to her. And that humility found itself and gave expression to her worship. Humility. Be clear. Hoss. You don't strut into worship. You don't strut into the presence of God. We come humbly. And we rejoice that He would even allow us to be here. You don't belong here. I don't belong here. None of us belong here. But God, who is holy through the work of His Son Christ, who is holy through the death of Christ, gives us this opportunity to be here. We don't deserve this. We didn't earn this. That's what Mary's saying. I know who I am. Some strut into worship as if God should rejoice that they are here. Pride never promotes genuine worship. I refer to it often because it's such a um, clear story. In Luke 18, Jesus tells a, a story about a Pharisee and a publican that came to worship one day. They went to the temple to worship. And the Pharisee, you know the Pharisees, they were the religious big dogs. They were the religious elite of the elite. To be a Pharisee, you had to meet many standards. You usually had to be rich. And, and you had to know certain amounts of Scripture. And you had to usually kind of have to be from the right family. They were the religious uppity-ups of Jesus' day. They wore the right garb. They wore the right clothes. They prayed at the right times. They attended the temple. They gave the right amount of money. But they all did it hypocritically. (laughs) They prayed so everybody could hear them. They gave so everybody could see them. Everything they did was hypocritical. But they looked good on the outside. I mean, these were the guys we make preachers and deacons out of, okay? No offense to preachers and deacons. But you know what I'm saying. I mean, if a Pharisee, I mean, this is the guy you wanted. In the church, because he walks, he looks like the part, but looking like the part doesn't mean you're playing the part or know, even know what the part is. So Jesus tells a story. Here's these super religious Pharisees, and one of them comes to worship one day, and, and he comes in proud, and he struts down the aisle and literally pretty much says to God, I know you're glad I'm on your team. He does. He walks right down front. You can read the story. He walks right down front. And boldly, with with chin up and chest out, says, I know you're glad I'm here. I know you couldn't make it without me, God. You know, one of the most liberating days in my life, and I'm very serious about this, was many, many years, several years ago, while I was pastoring here, when I realized that God can make it without me. He can make it without me. He doesn't need my advice. (laughs) He can do, he can do, he created a universe and I wasn't there. How did he pull that off? So this Pharisee is just, he knows God's glad he's on his team and that he's representing for Jehovah God. 
Now, there was a publican. Now, publicans, Pharisees were with a capital P. Publicans were with a small p. Publicans were nobodies. They were kind of like Mary. They were nobodies. No uh, socioeconomic status, no money, no rich family, um, peasants and, and, and blue-collar, you know, kind of working people like most of us. And there, there wasn't really anything special about a publican. But a publican came that morning to worship too. And the Bible says, Jesus tells a story he, that he stood back there as far as you could get without being outside the worship place. So somehow, maybe they walked from the outside, maybe they walked from their camels in the parking lot together to the door. The Pharisees strutted on down. Publicans stood back there. Pharisee said, God, as a matter of fact, God, let me give you an illustration of how important I am. God, you see that, fair, that publican back there? You see him? You know I give more money than he does. You know I'm more faithful than he is. You know I know more of the Old Testament scriptures than he does. God, I thank you. Now, you talk about audacity. This is the kind of guy you want to throat punch. In a Christian way. <laughs> God, I, I know you love me because I am so much better than he is. Now, some of us have gone to church with people like that. Amen? We have. And it's not pleasant. So the Pharisee does his spiel. Fair, publican stands way back there. And the Bible says the publican smote his breast. That was an old Hebrew way of showing humility. To physically go like that. He smote his breast in humility. And all he said in worship that day was this. God be merciful to me, a sinner. And Jesus then asked the question, who do you think left the temple righteous before God that day? Rhetorical question. He was that publican. Ladies and gentlemen, we don't strut into worship. We don't bring our pride in here. None of us have a reason to even be here outside of the Lord Jesus Christ. Pride never promotes worship. And God be merciful to me, a sinner, is a prayer that is, in the, is the heart of true worship. God be merciful. So this was Mary. Her worship was internal. It was intense. It was humble. It was habitual. It wasn't going to stop that day. What does that say to us at Christmas time? There is no worship at Christmas unless, unless it acknowledges Christ as the Savior from our sins. There is no worship at Christmas or throughout the year unless it realizes that we have no claim on worship or Christ or goodness or heaven outside of Jesus Christ. Every individual in the early Christmas narrative, worshipped God by blessing Him, praising Him, rejoicing in Him, thanking Him, glorifying Him. It all constituted worship and the spirit of Christmas, whether it was singularly or personally or cumulative, cumulative or communally with others publicly. The spirit of Christmas is not family or food or festivities, although all those things are good. Those are good things. Without the worship of Christ, they miss the mark. I mentioned this last week, and I want to mention it again before we close this series. I'm just intrigued in the whole Christmas narrative here about all of these people. You had ladies worshiping, like Elizabeth, Mary, Anna, ladies worshiping. You had, you had uh, not far from the ground shepherds. 
kind of the, the lower guys in the world back then. Shepherds were of a low class, and you had, you had low, low shepherds worshiping. You had Simeon, a guy who hung around, very righteous man, hung around the temple all the time. He was always at church. He was worshiping. You had Anna, a widower, a widow who was always at the church. She worshiped. You had the angels worshiping. You have brilliant wise men, educated intellectuals coming and worshiping Jesus. Isn't that beautiful? Again, you don't have to be rich or poor or educated or uneducated. There's no criteria for any of that. It's just realizing wherever your station in life that, that humility breeds worship. And we all owe Jesus the debt of worship. We owe him that. Mary responded just like Elizabeth did, Zechariah did, the angels did, the shepherds did, Simeon did, Anna did, the wise men did. They all responded to the presence of Christ in the same way. And I wanted to read all of the Magnificat to you because I want you to see the great knowledge that Mary, this young girl, had about the Old Testament. And I... I, I got to be through, but I, I have to say this. Mary did not worship God I'm looking for a word. She didn't worship him stupidly. did you did you follow when I read this? She knew God's work in the Old Testament. She was familiar with what God had done with Israel. She was familiar with the doctrine of God, who God is, what God had done. You read down through here, your mercy, you've shown it to generation, your strength. Look at all the things she said, the mighty, God, you are mighty, you've done great things, you are holy, merciful, you've shown strength, you've scattered the proud, you've brought down the mighty, you've exalted the humble, you've filled the hungry, you've helped your servant Israel, you've spoken to our fathers. How did she know all that? Because she had been a student, even as a young girl, she had been a student of the Old Testament. She knew the story of God. And it is reflected in the song that she sang. As a young girl, Mary knew more about God than many folks who have been in church 40 years. I don't say that condemningly. I put that on preachers. <laughs> We should have done a better job teaching people. I put that on us. Now consider that Mary had a good, his, a good knowledge of God's history. Yet as a girl, as a woman, she had no access to the synagogue where that was taught. They wouldn't let women in there. She had no access to a, a priest. She had no access to a rabbi because rabbi only, rabbis only chose young men to follow them. She was a woman in this culture. I'm not saying it was right. I'm just saying this is the way it was. Women weren't taught. Women weren't allowed to be educated. Women didn't have any status. And here's this little 14, 15-year-old girl that somebody has taught the Old Testament to. I'm guessing her parents. Because she had no access otherwise. She knew God. She knew the activities of God. Her parents taught her well. So let me do an advertisement. Can I do a commercial? Lord willing, Lord willing, in the middle of January, sometime in the middle of January, I'm going to begin a sermon series. It's not a fancy title. It's not, it's not going to look good on a billboard. I'm going to do a sermon series, Lord willing, called The Doctrine of God. 
Now, before you think, you talk about God every Sunday. It's not going to be like that. And I ask for your prayers. Because sometimes I'm convinced many church people claim to have a God, but they don't know anything about Him. They know nothing about Him. In fact, they're going to stay, if they go to heaven, they're going to stand before a God about whom they know very little. So, Lord willing, and I've already began, I began study on it months ago. It will be the hardest, most difficult sermonic undertaking I have ever undertaken. And I stand fearful trying to preach a series on the doctrine of God. So, I need your prayers. But Mary was taught the doctrine of God. That little young lady knew God. She knew the Old Testament. She knew God's history. She knew the strong arm of the Lord. Somebody taught her that. And I just wanted to throw that in. So, so, so the spirit of Christmas is worship. And worship, not just at Christmas, but all throughout our Christian experience, should be internal it should be intense, it should be habitual, and it should be humble. That's the spirit of Christmas. And may we so worship the Christ of Christmas in that way this Christmas season. Worship the new born King. Let's pray.